with us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If we would turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 35, I believe it is. Don't quote me on that one just yet. But Genesis chapter 35, yes, Genesis chapter 35. And today we're going to be talking about uh, Benjamin. Um, he is the youngest of the uh, children of Jacob. Now, we didn't talk about the two sons of Joseph, which was Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, and in our future studies, we will get to Manas uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, who were the two sons of Joseph while he had them while in Egypt. These were the two sons that were born to him, again, to rem and, and they reminded him of his struggle in Egypt and how through the grace and the power of God, God had caused him to be fruitful in that strange land. And also God had uh, uh, allowed him to forget the, 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 the trials, the toils of his home. The two sons or the son of Ephraim, which would go on later to represent the northern tribes of Israel. We read about that in the book of Hosea. Again, we'll study that at a later time. And then you had the tribe of Dan, of who we looked at, were the two lost tribes. Those were the two that were lost. And it's interesting, when you look at Ephraim and you look at Dan, those were the two places that permitted Jeroboam to begin or con to construct false worship. In Ephraim, which was at Bethel, and then in Dan is where he erected those two golden calves and led the people into false worship. And when you look at that worship, the Bible shows that all the way, though Jeroboam had died, all the way to the end, it would often refer to the kings as continuing in the sins of Jeroboam. Though he had died, long been gone, his influence was felt all up until God finally allowed the king of Assyria to come and to take them into captivity where that influence was permitted. Because you remember that the Levites were not given an inheritance, but the Levites were given cities of refuge, refuges. And these cities were in every tribe. They were in the lands of all the tribes of Israel. So the influence of true worship, though Jerusalem, God would later put his name in Jerusalem, and, and the book of Deuteronomy shows how the people of God were to come to Jerusalem three times in a year for various feasts. But throughout the entire year, the cities of refuge where the Levites were, were to continue to be a saver of life. They would continue to teach the people of God who God was, so in spite of all the heathen nations around them, they would not lose sight of Jehovah if they continued to give heed to the principles that were taught to them by the Levites. But the Bible tells us that as the days of Judges came, it says that they began to worship Baal. They began to uh, uh, forget the worship of their fathers. And that lies the responsibility lies in the home because God says in the book of Deuteronomy that upon our doorposts, parents were to teach their children and they're rising up as they were to walk by the way and then they're lying down. So parents were to have worship in their homes with their children. When the children would participate in the various feasts, the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 13 that it would come that they would ask, what are these feasts? Why are we doing this? And then the parents were not to say, well, ask your Sabbath school teacher. Well, when you get to church, well, we'll, we'll ask the elder. We'll ask the pastor when we get to church. No, parents were to show and instruct and show their ch children why these various feasts were kept. Parents were to be the instructors. And the church was to work in harmony with the home. The schools were to work in harmony with the home. They want to be at, they want to be at odds or cross purposes. They were to be 
one working together. So the first defense was to be the home. And then it was to be the church. So if you find that in the book of Judges, when they began to wander from God, it was because there was a breakdown in the home. Because if you look at uh, uh, Gideon's home, Gideon's father worshipped Baal. He was a leader in false worship. And God told Gideon that before I send you to deal with the heathen, you need to tear down this idol that your father established. So our greatest struggles, brothers and sisters, and the resistance of sin does not generally come from the world, may it, though it may seem so because of the volume, but our greatest struggles will come from within. In our homes and yea, even in our hearts, the greatest struggles we have to fight is with ourselves. It's with our flesh. And so we find that there was a breakdown in the home, which will later also become a breakdown in the church. And so to say in the book of Judges chapter 2 that they forgot God, it's because they weren't talking about him at church. They weren't talking about him in the home. They would try to get ready on the Sabbath to worship God, but six days of walking with the enemy is very hard to try to pivot and start to worship God. And so these influences got stronger and stronger and stronger while you could still have churches in the midst of them and they still were worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth. They could have the priests and the Levites with them and they were still worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth. And it got so bad in Israel that even when the ark was taken, there was no, there was no effort or determination to go get it back. They left it gone, and it would not have come back if the, if the Philistines didn't want it. If they did not recognize that, you know what, we can't keep this here among us. If they hadn't gotten rid of it, brothers and sisters, the ark never would have come back because the people of God, they were so careless without it. They were just living their lives. The glory of God, as, as, as uh, Phinehas' wife says, the glory of God has departed, and guess what? No one sought after it. The true word of God, the teachings of God were not there and no one cared. For 20 years, the ark was gone. And, and Samuel, when he had risen by God, Samuel made no effort to bring it back because he realized that it wasn't the physical ark they needed as much as the understanding of who God was. Because once they understood who God was, then the ark could be put in its proper place. But if they did not understand who God was, <clears throat> to bring the ark back would have just been another idol amongst all the other idols they had. And so he had to educate and educate. He traveled among the tribes, teaching them the principles of God to bring them back. Because even when the Philistines brought the ark back, they irreverently took the ark and they had it in a field somewhere, just sitting on a rock. Some tried to open the ark. Man, let's see inside. But all of this, while the, is, while the priests were around, they had lost a sense of reverence of the character of God. They lost a sense of his holiness. And that's what false teaching does. False teachings lead the people of God to look upon God as a common buddy. God is their daddy. He's their, he's, he's their buddy. He's cool. I saw someone, uh, 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 they had a shirt on, and it says, uh, I can't even remember what it said, but something like, you know, uh, God is good or God is cool or some, something to that degree. But this is what false teaching does. It gets us to bring God down to a common level. And this is why our churches are the way that they are. You can't reform the church without first having the home reformed. The home reformed. You can't bring true worship back into the church until true worship is first brought back into the home. Amen. If the idols in the home are still up, guess what? They'll eventually be seen in the church. The way we carry ourselves in home worship is the way we're going to carry ourselves in public worship. If we allow our, 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 our children and even ourselves, if we come to worship irreverently in our homes, then we're going to come to worship irreverently at church. 
we come while well, I'm at home so I could put on some beat up jogging pants and come in old beat up robe and have our heads all tied up with, with bandanas and curlers and hair uncombed and all. If we do that, then guess what? It shows our irreverence. And eventually we'll put on a suit on to cover it and come to church, but the irreverence is still there. We have to realize, you know that even when you're on the phone and you're doing and you're working at a call center, you're having to make important calls, they tell you to get dressed. Get dressed, put a shirt on, put it because it changes your demeanor. You can be dressed casual and call someone and they say, man, will you sleep? You say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm moving around. But, you're, but if you are dressed and you're, you're, you're up and you're, you're going about, it tells in your voice. So we have to have a reverence with God. And as we read his word, asking God, Lord, to change us. Why was God, uh, um, um, why was it? that they were not allowed to come near to the mountain. Why did God say put a barrier up? Because they were so used to false worship. Let's go in there and look and see what God looks like because they were used to seeing these false gods in Egypt. But he said put a barrier up because I want to save them. I want to spare them and God was trying to show them his irreverence, show them how holy he is. And he told them that even I'm coming in three days, he said wash your clothes. Get your house ready because I'm going to pass through and I don't want to see any uncleanness. Amen? Amen. These things, brothers and sisters, are still needful today. You know, if you uh, see a Muslim, you know, a Muslim, when they have that Quran, they don't have the Quran on their dashboard. They don't sit the Quran down any place low in their homes. They sit it up high. Now, again, we could look at some of these things and we could see paganism per se, but the reality of it is, is that their worship of their God, who is not God, we show great, they show greater reverence and respect for him than we show for ours. Than we show for ours. And so there has to be, there has to be a change in our minds. If we're going to go before the world and show them who God is, then they have to see who he is by the way we carry ourselves. And everything that God has given to us, it is not to make us a gazing star. It is not to make us uh, uh, something that people just look at as strange and odd. Again, it is something that will cause the world to see and look and wonder who we are so we can glorify our Father which is in heaven. Amen. When we come to the tribe of Benjamin, and as we begin to look and study into the tribe of Benjamin, we once again will see the characteristics of Jesus. We will see the character traits of Christ. Because one thing we said, when you look at all the tribes in Israel, they had different mothers. But one thing in common, they had the same father. They come from different experiences, as it were, but they are drawn together in that one unique bloodline, and that is the father. So we understand that when the Bible tells us in the book of first Corinthians, write it down. First Corinthians 15 verse 22 and 23, where it talked about in Adam, we all die, but in Christ, we shall all be made alive. It talks, says the first Adam was made a living soul, but the second Adam was made a quickening spirit. Christ is the second Adam. Adam stood as the father of the race. Paul says that through Adam, all sin has passed upon all. But through Christ, life has come. So where Adam fell and Satan stood and said that he was at the head of the race in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, Christ comes as the second Adam and he conquered where Adam fell. Now Jesus becomes a second Adam. And guess what? He now stands at the head of the race. So when the Bible says in the book of, in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, when it refers to the everlasting father, it's talking about Jesus. He is the father of the human race. Are we together? And through redemption, 
through adoption. He is our everlasting father. So when you look in Revelation 14 and you see the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion, what does Mount Zion symbolize in the Bible? God's people, right? Mount Zion. <clears throat> and so you see Christ standing, the, the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is also the city of David. It was a city of the great king. Bearing, as it were, the government, the law of God upon their shoulders, carrying out the, the principles of heaven because where the king is, is the law. So as the 144,000 are standing there on Mount Zion, representatives in their lives of the law of God, bearing the government, as it were, upon their shoulders because it is through them that God is going to finally end the great controversy. They are going to show forth the true character of God. And so as they stand there, who is in their midst? Christ is in their midst. So just like the 144,000 coming from all different walks of life, one thing they all have in common is Jesus. If it was not for Christ, they, they could do nothing. What did the Bible say? It says in the book of Zechariah chapter 13, as well when Christ was about to go into the garden of Gethsemane and he says that tonight the shepherd will be smitten and the sheep will do what? Scatter. Anytime the truth is cast down, guess what? The church scatters. But it is when we began to embrace the truth once again that God is able to bring us back together. Why is there scattering among us? It is because the truth, brothers and sisters, has been smitten among us. If you were to do a survey, even among those who profess present truth, you will find some stark differences of their belief of what is present truth. There's a scattering among us. <clears throat> but until we can come back together, it's not coming back together and saying, okay, well, what do you believe? Well, let's see. No, is we have to fall on that rock and be broken. Because when the disciples were scattered, the men on the road to Emmaus, they met Jesus. Peter was convicted of Christ after cursing and swearing and, and evidently testifying to truth in one sense. In, in practical sense, it was a lie. But in a spiritual reality, it was truth. I don't know him like I thought I knew him. I, I really don't know who Christ is. Why? Because like we said in Sabbath school, we have our own ideas of, what, who, of who Jesus is. We have forged in our minds a picture of Christ that, that unfortunately Christ is going to say to, to multitudes, I never knew you. But Lord, didn't we do all these things in thy name? Paul says there was another Jesus. There was another gospel. And there was another spirit. Christ says, I never knew you because what you did, again, you wasn't consulting God for it. You was just doing it. And it became your motive to be seen of men. And Christ was able to say, guess what? You have your words. You have your reward. You wanted the crowd to be drawn to you. You wanted likes on your page. You wanted people to recognize your video. Guess what? You got it. But Lord, deny, I don't know you. That is not the spirit that I gave my, my disciples. That's not the unction from on high that you had. That was another Jesus. Remember early writings? She saw some that were kneeling by the throne and they were praying and they did not observe the moving of Christ. And Satan came in and took that work up. And what did he breathe on them? Light and power. But they had no sweet love, joy, and peace. They had no, no, no joy of salvation, no desire to see people saved. They were concerned about light and power. And multitudes are following individuals because of their light and their power. The information, but not because of that sweet love, joy, and peace that comes when we are cleansed of all sin. That is not the experience. And so what happens is, <clears throat> we, 
when we understand of how God is bringing together and bringing about this 144,000, the crisis will reveal the experiences that they have been having with Christ. They have been convicted. They have been acknowledging and recognizing their sinfulness. They've seen that while professing to have a name that they live, they're dead. Yes, they were. Yes, yes, I'm the lawgiver. And yet, over here, doing things that are unseemly and ungodly. Yes, I'm the, I'm the firstborn, as it were. I'm the excellency of his strength, but I'm defiling my experiences by relationships that I'm engaging in. Thinking that the father doesn't know it. But he's watching. And if, and if we don't get the victory over it, then brothers and sisters, the crisis will only reveal our indecision. Remember, almost, almost saved is to be wholly lost. Almost. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I have a desire to be among the 144,000. I have a desire to be ready when Jesus comes. But brothers and sisters, I don't even think that we're looking for Jesus to come. We have a greater desire for the time of trouble than we do to see Christ. We have a greater desire to see the Sunday law passed. We have a greater desire to, to, to see laws uh, uh, take away our freedoms than we do to see Jesus coming. Because we're ready so when the trial comes that we're going to exert some type of physical ingenuity and, and we're going to be able to point at our sophisticated way of catching water and our sophisticated way of being able to get electricity while being off the grid than we have to show people Christ. We want to show people that we can be off the grid. And not only are we off the grid physically, but we're off the grid spiritually too. We're not depending upon Christ. And so we're, 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 we're anticipating, like the disciples were, they weren't anticipating the righteousness of Christ being revealed. They're not, they weren't anticipating this lowly uh, lamb to come and take away the sin of the world. They were ready for a kingdom to come. I want to read something to you in the book Desire of Ages. Write this down. Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages. Uh, let's see. Getting back to the reading of these books. So I read these books, we could, we could get more in. Notice what it says. Desire of Ages, this is taken from page 61. Desire of Ages, page 61. We have seen his star. This was the condition of Israel when the wise men came. And she tells us that these wise men, though they were heathen, they had a better understanding of the scriptures than the Pharisees did. They had a better understanding of prophecy than those who stood up and expounded prophecy to the people every single Sabbath. These were not ungodly heathens. These were people who were studying nature and remember uh, steps of Christ, nature and revelation testify of God alike. So David says that the heavens declare the what? The glory of God. It says they're, 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 there's no language where their voice is not heard. These men actually had read the writings of Balaam. Balaam was a false prophet. But God had gotten control of Balaam's vocal cords, and Balaam could not but utter the truth. And so there are many things among the false prophets that truth can be found. Now, you don't need to be, now, now, let me say this. That's right. That's right. Amen. So, you, you got the point, right? So, no one in here needs to go find the book of Judas and, and reading from the book of Jab Jabaz. And you don't, you're none, of, none of us in here should be look, reading at Maccabees and going, we don't need to do that. Amen? Amen? So, you can, even the devil will tell the truth. So, we don't need to go and search throughout all these things just to find one little gem. We have the truth. Amen? So we don't have to, you know, let the wise men read uh, uh, the book of Balaam and, and come to the truth and then show them the, the full truth. Amen. We don't need to be going and studying all that and, and reading Albert Pike's books and, 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 
And, and we don't need to comb through error to find truth. We have the truth. Amen? Yeah. Now, notice. So here are these wise men. They're seeing this star. And it's not, it's not a star per se. They're actually being led and guided by angels. Yeah. I mean, God takes it upon himself to tell Gabriel and a host, lead them to the city. Guide them into the city. Now, I want you to notice what happens because we, in here in Desire of Ages, under this chapter, we have seen a star. The, the shepherds had already come. The shepherds have already been made aware of the coming of Christ. That, that, not the coming of Christ, but that Jesus had been born. So the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they had already understood that noise had been made uh, a noise throughout the nation that the Savior has come. And then all of a sudden, now these wise men are coming. But I want you to notice something here. Um, and this is page 61, Desire of Ages. It says, 16 to 61, it says, they, they reached the land of Israel and were descending the Mount of Olives with Jerusalem in sight. When lo, the star that has guided them all the weary way rest above the temple. And after a season fades from their view, with eager steps, they press onward confidently expecting the Messiah's birth to be the one. The joyful, oh, pardon me, have mercy. Sorry, sorry, I'm, thinking, I'm so used to this. All right, the joyful, y'all have phones and stuff, amen, right? Y'all be doing something else with it, so, you know, so pull up the side of ages, page 61. Notice what it says. It says, they expected to, 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 to hear the Messiah's birth, the joyful burden on every tongue, but their inquiries are in, their inquiries are in vain. Entering the holy city, they repair to the temple. They go to the church. To their amazement, they find none who seem to have a knowledge of the newborn king. They're, they're, they're talking to the members. Where's Jesus? Jesus, what are you talking about? They don't understand the prophecies. This is what it's saying. They don't understand the prophecies. They're not expecting him to come. They're expecting for their leaders to tell them it's about time. And you know, brothers and sisters, I read the other, not the other day, but a, a three weeks ago, where someone was actually, someone actually told people, members of the church, and they said, when it's time for you to go to the country, we'll let you know. This man literally put that on paper and said, when it is time for you to leave the cities, your leaders will let you know when it's time. I wasn't so much blown away by the fact that he said that. I was blown away that he actually put it on paper, that it could be shared around and that he signed his name to it. That you would be, that, that you would have on record, that you would look to the people of God who have their Bibles, who have access to the writings of the prophet and dare tell them that when it is time for you to respond to this, we'll tell you. So in other words, all of your understanding of the scripture, you defer to what we say. And this is one of the reasons why they rejected Jesus, because Jesus would not defer to their teachings. He would not accept their interpretations of the scriptures. And because of this, they said, we got to do away with him. And today, those who do not accept or do not defer to the, to the prescribed, voted stance of a, of a small minority in the church, then you are considered as a lunatic fringe of the church. And it is only a matter of time that you're going to be weeded out. Notice, this is what it said. Notice what it says again. It says, they, they're, 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 they're surprised that people do not have a knowledge of the newborn king. It says their questions call forth no expression of joy but rather of surprise and fear not mingled with contempt. 
not unmingled, pardon me, with contempt. Now watch this. The priests are rehearsing traditions. They extol their religion and their own piety while they denounce the Greeks and Romans as heathen and sinners above all others. So now they come to the church and when they get to the church, what do they hear? They hear the minister talking about bad, how everybody else is. Lifting up their own piety, lifting up their own beliefs while everybody else is considered heathen. This is what they come and they hear. They don't hear the, 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 the prophecies. They don't hear the truth being spoken. They're actually hearing the minister talking about what's going on in the government. Just to put it a little plainly so we understand. We know more about what's going on on this. Oh, let me say this. We think we know more about what's happening on this earth. But we know little about heaven. The very thing that we said, the very thing that we are told in Great Controversy, page 48, that we should have a knowledge of, so many of us are still ignorant of. And that is on the work that Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary on December 5th, 2020. What is he doing on December 5th, 2020? What is that work that's happening in heaven? That thing that we should all have a knowledge of, we're ignorant of it. But we think we know who's going to be in the White House. We think we know who's going to be in the Senate. We think we know what they're going to do when they get inaugurated. We think we know what they're going to do in January, in December. We think we know. But the thing that we ought to know, we are still ignorant of it. And it is showing in our experiences. And we're becoming more and more afraid of what the future holds. We're becoming more and more disillusioned by what is happening around us. And we have no idea what steps we ought to take. We have no idea what we should be doing. We're not pressing into his presence. We're not praying more. Probation is about to close, but we're still not praying any, any more than before we thought probation was closing. Sunday law is about to be passed, and we're not praying any more than we thought any more now than we were before we heard all these things. So if it's not inspiring that type of hope in us, then brothers and sisters, what type of, what do you think that's inspiring in us? A spirit that is not coming from God is it's a spirit of fear. Not of love, power, and a sign mind. We're not asking God, Lord, what should I do in this situation? What should I do in this situation? We're not doing it. Let's go on. Let's go on here. So it says... The wise men are not idolaters, and in the sight of God, they, are, they stand far higher than do these, his professed worshipers, yet they are looked upon by the Jews. Let's say Seventh-day Adventists. Can we say that? Because that's what we're talking about, because that was the first coming. Here we are at the second coming. Jews are looking for another coming, but, but this isn't applying to them. This is talking about us. We are the remnant of that seed, are we not? Notice it says, it says, and are looked upon as, and are looked upon by the, by seven day Adventists as heathen, even among the appointed guardians of the holy oracles, their eager questions touch no cord of sympathy. Now, brothers and sisters, you say, well, pastor, what does this have to do with Benjamin? Go in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. You should be there now. Genesis chapter 35. Because we're going to understand and see that these wise men have everything to do with the experience of Benjamin. Notice what the Bible tells us here in the book of Genesis. And we're at chapter 35. Chapter 35. And we want to look in verse 16. Genesis chapter 35. And we want to look at verse 16. The Bible says, and they journeyed from Bethel. Now, the context is they, uh, chapter 34, diner is, is I'm trying to think of a, 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 a polite way. Diner is defiled. She's violated. Thank you. She is violated by the people of Shechem. 
her brothers respond in retaliation. And all of a sudden, all of these various uh, uh, people are brought among and scattered among the Israelites. And Jacob looks at all these people and say, you know what? He says, God comes and God says, hey, we need to go back to Bethel. Bethel is what? The it's the house of God. What, what, what did Jacob see at Bethel? Ladder. He saw the ladder. The ladder represents who? Christ. Christ, right? And he said, this is the very gate of heaven. So Jacob now realized God says we need to go back to Bethel. But before he goes, he says you need to change your clothes. All those gods in your ears, all those gods on your fingers, and even, to, even more so, all those gods in our thoughts, they have to be surrendered. And what does he do with them? He buries them under an oak, buries them under a tree, brings them, as it were, to the foot of the cross. And that's where he surrenders them. They're buried there, not to be retrieved again. They're surrendered. And so as this cleansing takes a place, now God brings them to the church. Are we together? Now, so as Jacob realizes that, hey, we need to go back to where God brought us. The idea is not the location per se, as much as the experience is being brought out. We need to return back to our first love. We need to have that, that rebirth needs to be rekindled. That experience of salvation when, 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 when we first heard the truth and we had a desire to walk in the truth. When we began to hear the gospel and man, when I heard the gospel, I would just, I wanted to pray. I wanted to study. I used to talk to people about Jesus. But as time drew on and as I got <clears throat> caught up in the mundane things of life, I began to get lukewarm. And I had no idea that I was in a condition of actually being spewed out. Why? Because I didn't realize my condition no longer. I had a name, Israel, that I lived. I was a prince, but my, my lifestyle was not in harmony with God. And so now this, this, this tragedy now awakens me to the, to the experience. And God says, go back to Bethel. Yes, they're going back to the literal, to the literal place, but God is trying to bring them back to their first love. God is trying to give them a new experience because Jacob knew what Bethel is, but his children didn't. They didn't understand Bethel. Are we together? So now he, he's, he's taking them back to Bethel and, on, and now they get to Bethel and they're leaving Bethel because they're still trying to get to his father's house. Jacob is still trying to get among his inheritance because there's, he's promised something because he encounters, talk to me, he encounters Esau. He's on his way back to his inheritance still. And so in the midst of all this, you know, he kind of says, hey, let me just hang out here in Shechem. You know, uh, uh, trouble is past. Me and Esau is in good graces. You know, probation hasn't closed. God has extended my life. Let me just hang out in Shechem and see if I could, you know, I could, I could multiply and get rich a little bit. And all of a sudden, trouble comes. Because guess what? Shechem was not his inheritance. Are we together? That's not what God, that's not what God saved you from Esau for. He didn't save you to go into, come into some alliance with some heathens. You would have showed them the truth. But he got there and said, hey, man, we could get rich. You know, just make a little exchange and start exchanging pulpits. You know, and hey, I'll go and preach at their church and they'll come and preach at mine. And, you know, we could have, you know, just kind of mingle a little bit. And at the same time, get us some cattle, get us some money. You know, we can we can put it into the work. But all of a sudden trouble breaks out. And he's reminded this is not your home. You're a stranger. You're a sojourner. And so now he has to realize, you know what? We have to focus again. This earth is not our home. My inheritance is, has not yet been accomplished. I need to go back there. That's what God wants me to have. And now all of a sudden, as he's going there, Rachel dies. Rachel dies. And you have to wonder if he hadn't got distracted 
could Rachel had made it to the promised land. But because the head of the home allowed his family and his providing for them to distract him from God's purpose. And in the midst of this, his family gets caught up in something that never might have happened had he kept his eyes like a flint moving in the direction God wanted him to. But because he got off course, his children got infected by the people of Shechem. And he brought this influence into a home which never should have been there if he had set his face like a flint. But he got distracted. And in the way, Rachel dies. Doesn't get to see the father. Now again, we don't know what's going to happen, but the, but the reality of it is, brothers and sisters, is that many times our families are being affected by the decisions that the heads of the homes are making. Or let me say, are not making. They're being infected. And, and we must not assume that our children are going to have their spiritual stamina to change at the last minute. So what happens is, <clears throat> they're going, they're coming to the way. And then it says in verse 16, verse 16, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed and had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Remember, she already had Joseph. Thou shalt have this son also. Verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing for she died that she called his name Benoni. Benoni means the son of my sorrow. The son of my sorrow. Here she's dying. Here she has this burden. She's in physical pain. And all of a sudden she says this. Remember the midwife said, you're going to have this son also. But she said, it's the son of my sorrow. This experience does not bring me real joy as it ought to bring. <clears throat> as Paul talks about, I believe he says that, you know, when he talks about joy for that a son is born, this joy is not there. She says, this is a son of my sorrow. So close and yet so far. So close to the promised land, but yet so far because death now stands between me and the promise. But oh, brothers and sisters, there's still hope because while she calls him the son of Benoni, Benjamin, uh, the father comes back and calls him the son of Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand. This is my left, but you're right. The son of my right hand is what Benjamin's name means. Are we together? So now, what is the spiritual lesson? As we get close to the kingdom and we recognize, yes, we are still a great way off. But there's something about the son of sorrow. Notice what the Bible says. We're coming back here. But go in your Bible to the book of Isaiah 53. Where are we going? Isaiah 53. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. And we want to look at verse 1. Isaiah 53, looking at verse 1, reading down to verse Four, and notice what the scriptures tells us in Isaiah 53, looking at verse 1. And prior to me reading that, I want to, Lord, help us. I want to read this from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 430 into 430, well, 430 to 434. I'm not going to read all of it, but put it in your notes. Patriarchs and Prophets. 430 to 434. So far, so close, but yet so far. Because here's death between me and the promise. She hadn't got to the promise yet. They had got caught up in Shechem. The promise was still what they were striving for. The inheritance. God lifted 
that, that, that in extended probation. Jacob was to die because of his transgression. Are we together? His sin in, in defrauding his brother for the birthright blessing. He had sinned, and now he was to pay the penalty. The wages of sin is death. But God lifted the penalty of death, and that penalty was lifted, not thrown into, into, the, not thrown into the stratosphere, but it was lifted, and it fell upon Jesus. That death that he deserved was lifted, and it was placed upon Christ. He deserved that death. And so now, brothers and sisters, as that death sentence was lifted, and while he can rejoice in the hope of inheritance, of the hope of his salvation, and he goes, he gets distracted in Hamor and Shechem. Now he carries a, a load of guilt, a burden that was unnecessary that he did not need to incur if he had kept his eyes focused, but God brought him back to the ladder. He brought him back to the ladder to let Jacob understand that you will only get to the point if you are depending on me. Can't depend upon your own ingenuity. Don't allow your children to use circumcision to be blasphemy than what circumcision was to be a sign of, and that was the covenant. Because the brethren, his children, used circumcision for their own profit. They brought reproach upon the sign of circumcision. Can you imagine coming to the people of Shechem uh, uh, later on and said, hey, y'all want to get circumcised? They said, oh, no, brother. You ain't circumcising me. I remember the last time your church came through here. Have mercy and baptized us. Baptized us and left us with nothing. You wonder why we send missionaries around the world. Uh, one gentleman came to me and says he was uh, about to get married in India. And the men of the city, the men of the village called him in. And they said, why do you want to marry our daughter? He said, well, you know, and he went to explain. They said, listen, um, we'll let you marry her. But you cannot be given Bible studies here. He said, because your people baptize some of my people. The, the Indian people who worshipped um, Krishna and their, their various religion. And they said, your people came here and baptized them, promised them goats and all this other stuff, and didn't do anything for them. Promised them you were, they could go to school for free and all this other stuff if they would convert. And, up, and uprooted and, and caused confusion in our village. So circumcision is a sign of baptism. And so you can imagine now, because these preachers went now into Shechem and used baptism to swell their own numbers. They weren't concerned about the people. They just went in there and baptized them. They didn't teach them anything. They baptized them with all their golden ear, all their gods in their ears, all their gods on their fingers. Gods in their minds, unfortunately, in the crusade, they probably used some of their gods to impress them. And all of a sudden, they come back and they say, hey, we're going to circumcise you, Shechem, by some more. No, you ain't circumcising us. No, no, last time you did it, you killed all the men of the city. So the same way, God has to show Jacob and reinstitute in his mind that that's not what circumcision is for. And so like his grandfather who went down into Egypt and could have been a blessing. And now the, and, and, and they had to say, man, go on and take your sister, which was like a rebuke. But take, go with your brother. No, good and well, that man is your husband. And sent him out of the city. Abimelech said, man, get out of here. You come in here and cause trouble. Abimelech was worshiping God according to the light that he had. Because uh, God re re uh, revealed himself to Abimelech. And Abimelech said, look, Lord, you know that I've done this out of the integrity of my, my heart. This man didn't tell me that this was his wife. He said, I know that's why I kept you from sinning. What was the sin? Adultery. Here was a heathen man, supposedly, but he was talking to God like he was a friend. And here the church was defrauding them. He said, man, bring that man in here. He said, man, why did you lie to us? 
What did you see here that caused you to lie? And Jacob said, and Abraham said, man, I saw not the fear of God in this place. But they were worshiping according to what they knew. And we judge people based upon our standard. But how can you say that they don't have the fear of God when you don't have them either? You're in here lying and talking about the fear of God. Hour of his judgment has come. And you're living worse than they are. Because you know better. Are we together? Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. sin. But God said to Abimelech, I kept you from what? Sinning. Mercy. Abraham was in sin. But still, God had a plan for Abraham. And he said, hey, he's going to pray for you. And, God, and, 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 and he said, but if you don't let that man go, you're going to be a dead man. And Abimelech let that man go out of the city. And so Jacob now is in Shechem. Jacob could be a witness. But what did he do? He let his pastors baptize people who didn't understand the truth. And God had to come back and had to, and Jacob now had to correct the false teachings that they gave to these people. I'm using it as a spiritual object lesson. Are we together? And he had to say, listen, I know they baptized you all, but there are still some things you don't understand. And so until you understand these things, really, you have not joined Christ, you may have joined the church, but you're not connected to Christ. So there, so when we follow Christ, we have to carry our cross. We have to die to self. We have to put the world behind us and put Christ in front of us. And by beholding and the things of this earth will what? Go strangely dim. And as they listen to Jacob explain and talk about the gospel, they took those things off. Because Jacob didn't run up to them and start snatching the earrings out of their ears. He didn't say, hold out your fingers and start snatching their rings off. He didn't go and say, bring me those. Uh, 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 he didn't make them go home and, and suspend their Netflix memberships. Mercy. I almost said DVDs, but that's archaic now. We don't, do, we don't use those anymore. That's, that's for the older generation. We got Netflix now, right? Hula, Hulu. Hulu. See, y'all know what it was, right? Amen. I know y'all watch Bible movies on it, but nonetheless. <laughs> but, the truth of the matter, <clears throat> but the truth of the matter is, Jacob did not force them to change. They could have said, you know what? This is too much for us. No, nah, we're taking our gods and we're going back home. We're going back to where we came from. But you know what? Jacob said, listen, we're going back to Bethel. That's where I met God at. That's where I saw the ladder. That's where God opened the door of salvation. And this is where I'm going. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is where we're going. Jacob's children were grown at this time. They were older. They, they could have been like, Pops, we, we stand here in Shechem. But they went too. And Jacob said, give me the gods in your ears. Give me those gods on your fingers. Give me those. Give me that. And you know what? <clears throat> they surrendered it. Why? Because they wanted to go to Bethel. They said, no, nah, we're not going back to Shechem. Man, those preachers, yeah, they didn't tell us the truth, but man, I'm glad I hear the truth now. I'm not going back to the God of Bethel. I, I'm not going back to the gods of Shechem. I'm like Ruth. I'm saying, Lord, entreat me not to leave thee. Where thou goest, I will go. Where thou liest, I will lie. And I pray that nothing but death shall separate us. And they had a desire, and they gave up those gods, and guess what? They went to Bethel. This is what happens, brothers and sisters. And they're going there. And they say, yes, we're going. And they're, and, they're, and they're following Jacob. And Jacob has this large caravan now. So what, 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 <clears throat> what was a curse, God turned it into a blessing. What Satan meant for evil, God now turns it for good. And Jacob now with this large tribe is going now. And remember, he still has to go to the promise. So he's accumulated all these individuals and he's taking them to the promised land. 
Brothers and sisters, Jacob went out by himself, but he came back with a multitude. And God brings us out of the world many times by ourselves, but when he brings us back to the kingdom, we need to have a multitude with us. We're not going into the kingdom by ourselves. God is showing us that, that he has given us a work to do. God has called us, brothers and sisters, to be the light of the world. God said it is not good for man. I'm not talking about physical marriage. But God said it's not good for the man to do what? To be alone. So understand, and our walk with Christ, it's not good for us to be by ourselves. There's others we have to bring into the kingdom. We have to bring them to a knowledge of the truth. Are we still together? Yeah. Amen. So this truth is, so now Jacob is coming. He's bringing this large caravan with him. And all of a sudden, uh, 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 Rachel on the borders, as it were, to coming to the promised land, <clears throat> be, as coming to the promised land, she goes into hard labor, travailing in birth as pain to be delivered. She's going through this experience. She's laboring and she's hard labor. And she says, wow, I'm so close, but yet so far. I'm not going to make it. Death is my lot. I see it. But now she's in labor with this son of sorrow. Look what it says in Isaiah 53. You're there? Uh, I'm going to read. I'm going to read picture on the prophets later. But notice what it says. Isaiah 53 verse 1. The Bible says, who hath believed our report to whom and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant as a root out of a dry ground he hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no one beauty that we should for he was despised and rejected of men a man of what and acquainted with grief and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our and carried our, yet we did esteem him, smitten of God. And, all right, this son of sorrow, brothers and sisters, is a type of Christ. Go back in your Bibles to Genesis. Go back in your Bibles to Genesis. Go back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 35. Are we still together? All right, we're going to tie this off here. We're going to tie this off here. This is a good place. Exodus, Genesis, chapter 35. Genesis 35. Here they are in the borders of Ephrata, and she's travailing in birth, and she's about to bring forth this son of sorrow. But I, oh, I didn't give you the text. It's in, it's in uh, Psalm 16 where it says, but remember, he said, no, not the son of sorrow, but the son of my right hand the bible tells us in the book of psalms 16 where he says i have foresaw i have always foresaw the lord he is before me he is even at my right hand psalms 110 says the lord said unto my lord sit thou at my right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool revelation 3:21 to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am sat down with my father, where? In his throne. So when Christ overcame, he sat down with the father in his throne on what side? Right side. We raise victory. Where do we sit with Christ? In his throne. Right side. Are we together? The son of the right hand. Thou shalt have this son also. Now, this is the point. She's so close, but yet so far. And guess what? Christ comes. Benjamin comes. Son of the right hand. What is that telling us, brothers and sisters? That tells us that our own decisions will cause us, will bring us so far, but no further. We can make a decision to move in the right direction, but the only thing will save us is Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of your own. It's Christ that does it. 
So while she is at the border, she can't get in because of death. Why does death come? Because of sin. You and I will not get in because of sin, but Christ can bring us through. Are we together? Christ, because it is not, he has not come to take the baton from us. We didn't have it to give. We lost the baton because of sin. Christ takes the baton and he runs the race for us. We run not as with some, some, some maybe I will. We run with the expectancy that through Christ we win. This is why Paul says, I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is a what? Crown laid up for me. Wait a minute. First Corinthians chapter nine, he says, let us all run that we may win. Where did he get the crown from? He got it from Christ. He accepted what Christ would do in humanity for him. He accepted that Christ would stand in his place. He accepted that Christ would plead his life in his behalf. He accepted the fact that for a righteous man, some would even dare to die. For a good man, one might consider, but the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ did it. And now having died, now having been given for us, will he not with all things give us Christ? So this is what, this is what we must understand that as Rachel is coming to this point and she's not able to get over because of death, but this son, hope it says, listen, you will bring forth this son. Christ is going to save us, brothers and sisters. So even though we may be in an experience of sorrow, we must look to Jesus. It is only by his life that salvation will be brought forth. Two passages. Notice Christ, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Patriarchs and Prophets. I want to read this to us. Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm starting on page 431. I gave you 430 to 434. Keep that in your notes. But again, I'm only going to highlight just a few points here. And then I want to read Desire of Ages, page 483, and we close on this. It says this. It says, while the sinner cannot save himself. Do we recognize that this morning? There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. All of your good church going doesn't mean anything. It doesn't amount to anything. So what we've been keeping the Sabbath, or we think that we've been keeping the Sabbath for a long time. By by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be what? Justified in his sight. I started keeping the Sabbath when I was 20 years old. Well, guess what? That don't make up for the first 20. And if you continue to live 40, 60 more years, it still won't make up for the sin. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. So before you could even start keeping the Sabbath right, you would first have to die and be born again physically and then start over with a clean slate. And nobody could do that. So no matter how hard you try, you're still under the sentence of death. Are you with me? Amen. That police officer get behind you. Once you break that law, you can slow down. His lights don't turn off, do they? No. They're still on. He get out, he's talking to you, and you're like, man, can you turn the lights off? I'm embarrassed out here. Those lights are still blaring. So slowing down now and coming, man, I just, I mean, I'm doing 85. You get to 55 all you want. He's going to stay right behind you. You can throw your hazards on, roll your window down a little bit. Guess what? He waiting for you to pull over. You're under the sentence of the law. So here you're running headlong towards hell. God shows you the truth. You slow down. Guess what? The light is still, they're still blazing. They're still blazing. You need Christ. You need mercy. You need his grace. You don't need to, it's not, hey, you know what? Officer, don't worry about it. You know what? I'm going to go back where I messed up and I'll start over and I'm going to come this way. Don't even worry about it. Don't write the ticket. I know it. I was doing 85 and a 55. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to drive. I'm going to get another lane. I'm going to drive all the way back to where, I, where you first saw me. And then I'm going to put it on 55 and I'm going to come through. Officer says, no, you've been drinking, son? 
Don't work like that. We can't justify ourselves. We're under the sentence of death, and we have to realize that. So now that we, once we can realize that, as we're looking towards this son of sorrow, yet God wants to let us know it is a son of his right hand. He is willing to bear your sorrow in your hard labor. Are we together? He's willing to wear that affliction. He's willing to wear that condemnation. He's willing to wear that, 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 that everything about you that other people don't know. Jesus is willing to bear it. And he's willing to wear it for you. And also, because of his victory, he now becomes the son of your right hand. Where you couldn't do it because of your sins. It says in Psalms 38, David says, I will be sorry for my sins. I will acknowledge who I am. I will come unto him because I labor and I'm heavy laden and I cannot find rest in all of my sins. My, they're becoming too much for me and they're, they're, they're starting to go over my head and I'm starting to become drowned in these things. I thought I gave them up. I thought I had victory over this thing. And now all of a sudden in this latter part of my experience, just as we're coming to the inheritance, these things are starting to show back up in our lives. And guess what? They're coming back in 4K. They're not coming back like the, the television where you had the antenna with the foil. Some of y'all don't know nothing about that. Some of y'all do. And you say, stand up there, and they got a hole and twist and, and turn and do all this. Do you see it yet? And you're sitting there trying to juggle the antenna, and, you're, and, you don't, and the wind blowing, you got to get up there again, and you got to get the pliers, and you got to put it all up there and fix the antenna, get the aluminum foil, and you got to have it up there. Go in everybody's house, and everybody got the same television. Everybody got the same problem, but not no more. It's 4K. Every television come with its own internet. Every television come with its own internal antenna. You can even talk to it now. Television, go to, pay, go to channel 64. And, it's, and that, they, that baby is clear. That's what our sins are like. They're coming back. We don't have to adjust. It's there. 4K, everybody can see it. It's clear. No, dis oh, man, your children, your children know your faults, don't they? They can see it. They look. Yes, we see it. It's in 4K, but so close to the kingdom and still looking at your own life and you're still so far away. We thought we had it. We thought we was going to make it. Oh, we were ready, and all of a sudden, 4K, uh, uh, Corona comes along, and wow, we're beginning to realize we are not ready for the kingdom. We're not ready. Everybody's been forced to look at themselves, and some still don't want to see how sinful they are. But God, but these things are coming back in our lives, and it's like, Lord, I don't have enough time to get it right. The son of our sorrow. And that's how we must see Jesus first. We have to allow the Spirit of God to cause us to be sorry for the sins we've committed. We have to be willing to allow God to show us how evil we are. Because, oh, brothers and sisters, next time we come together, when you look at this character, Benjamin, mercy. But here it is. I'm closed. I'm closed. I'm not even going to go to Desire of Ages 43. I'll close. It says, while the sinner cannot save himself. He still has something to do to secure salvation. Him that cometh to me, says Jesus, I will in no wise cast, I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. But we must come to him and we, and when we repent of our sins, we must believe that he accepts and he pardons us. Faith is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Faith is a gift of God. Faith is a gift of God, but the power to exercise it is ours. God gives all, to all of us the measure of faith. Everybody right now sat down in your chairs and it was by faith. You didn't shake the chair. You didn't test it. You didn't ask for a, a, a manual. You didn't ask. You just sat in it. That is a measure of faith that you would not fall. But now when it comes to spirit, so we have faith, but we must exercise it. 
No one is standing up for fear that the chair will fall. Everybody right now is sitting down. Why? Because you exercise faith that that chair could accomplish what you intended it to do. Same way, brothers and sisters, we must look to the word of God and believe that God's word can do exactly what God promises he will do with it. Are we together? You have to believe that. Notice, last point. It says, faith is the hand by which the soul takes hold of the divine offers of grace and mercy. Nothing but the righteousness of Christ. Nothing but what? Can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. Only his life can entitle us to the blessings of the covenant of grace. Now remember, she says, this is a son of my sorrow. The father comes back and says, no, he will be the son of my. Do you believe it? You can look at yourself and see how sinful you are. But if you're willing to see how sinful you are, are you willing to see that Christ will save you? In spite of what you now have in your life, in your luggage of life, do you believe that God can save you from it? Or will you hang on to that sorrow? Will you still pity yourself for your past life or will you accept God's promise of the future life? Are you willing to grab hold of that experience and says, Lord, even right now, I realize who I am. I know what I like. I know my dispositions. I know what I am unwilling to give up. I am unwilling to surrender that. Believe that God knows it. You say, huh? Pastor, what do you mean I'm unwilling to give up my sin? How long have you been practicing it? How long have you been doing it? How long have you known about it? How long have you known about that thing? Then that's obvious enough you're unwilling to get rid of it. Because you can't believe that God can forgive you of every other sin but that one. The problem is you don't want to give it up. And the problem is we keep telling ourselves that by and by I'll give it up, but not now. I'm not going to do it now. Maybe sometime down the line I'll stop. Maybe. God sees that. And we're told that one sin can neutralize all the power of the gospel. Just one. Maybe that's why you don't really desire to study the word of God. Maybe that's why you don't really want to spend time in prayer. Maybe that's why you just can't seem to be on solid ground. Could it be that one sin? And brothers and sisters, it is. But let's say with Christ today, Lord, not as I will, but may thy will be done. Lord, that thing that I don't want to give up, not what I want. What do you want? Are you willing to put that thing at that tree and let it be buried? Are you willing to let it, that ground be dug out and are you willing to allow that thing to be lowered down into the ground and to be covered over? Or are we going to be like Achan and be covered over with it? Because Achan died with his sin. He died with, that, with all those clothes he was unwilling to give up. That career he just wasn't willing to shed. He died with it. So we have a choice. We could either be like Achan. Or we could be like those Shechemites and just let it fall into the ground by itself. Father in heaven. Though Jesus is a son of sorrow, though Jesus is acquainted with our griefs, we are told that he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. 
all of that sorrow that Jesus went through was not for nothing. You said even our tears are in the bottom. The sorrows that we experience, they're not for nothing. But as Christ was a son of your right hand, may we today put the Lord in front of us and let him be at our right hand so we are not moved. May we allow Jesus to be Lord today. May we allow him to sit in his rightful place in our hearts. Breathe upon us, Lord. May we make this decision before we leave this place. There's no better time than the present. To say, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Is that your decision this morning? Is that your decision to give Jesus his rightful place in your life? Is that your decision this morning? God sees your hand. Lord, I want you to have that rightful place in my heart. God sees you this morning. And those of you who are watching online, just if you're, if you're watching, just, just say, Lord, put in the bottom, Lord, I see. Lord, I surrender all. That's your prayer. Just put in that, that comment box, Lord, I surrender all. Father in heaven, that is our decision today. We want to do it. And yet we wanted to do it last week. And we wanted to do it the week before. And now we find again the doors of the church are open to us. The doors of heaven are open to us. Lord, we don't want to leave not having made a decision. And so we make that decision right now. That's your prayer. Lord, I surrender all. Father, we thank you for hearing, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.